All right, after learning about basics of normal strain, it's time to test our understanding with some examples. The first example is a compound axial element that consists of two bars that is subjected to a force F at the right end and it is restrained at the left end. The length of each of these two bars are provided. Also, the amount of strain is measured in each of these two segments. We want to determine how much is the total elongation of the system from A to C. In order to solve that, we need to determine how much is the amount of deformation in each of these two bars. According to definition, strain is deformation divided by the initial length. Given the strain and the initial length, we can determine how much is the deformation in each of these two segments as epsilon multiplied by L. After determining the deformation in each of these two segments, we can determine how much is the total deformation, which is simply sum of these two values. So total deformation is simply delta 1 plus delta 2, because these two elements are connected together longitudinally. The second problem also consists of two parts. But in this case, strain is measured in segment 1 in AB, and also the total deformation in the system is provided and we want to determine how much is strain in the right segment. In order to solve that, again, we are going to start with determining how much is the deformation in the first segment. Knowing strain and length, we can determine that deformation. In order to determine deformation in segment 2, we need to subtract this deformation in segment 1 from the total deformation of the system. And once the deformation is determined in segment 2, we can simply determine strain in that segment by dividing the deformation over the length. These two problems were somehow similar to each other, where two elements were connected head to head, and the total deformation of the system was simply sum of the deformation of its components. In the next problem, we are going to talk about a little bit more complicated case where the elements are not directly connected together. In this problem, again, there are two bars, and strain is given in one of these two, and we want to determine strain in the other element. But the difference here is that these two elements are not directly connected together. The horizontal beam, which is shown in blue here, is connecting element 1 and element 2 together. And we want to solve this problem in three different cases. In the first case, all connections are tight and elements are fully connected together. In the second case, there is a gap of 1 millimeter at the connection between the rigid beam and element 2 at point C, and in the third case, there is a gap of 1 millimeter between the rigid beam and element number 1 at point B. Okay, this problem is a little bit tricky, and I recommend you to pause here and think about this problem and try to solve that before looking at the solution of this problem. Let's start with the first case, which is the simplest part. Given the amount of strain and the initial length of the element, we can determine how much is the amount of deformation in element 1. Delta 1 is going to be epsilon 1 multiplied by L1. In this case, epsilon 1 is given to be negative, which means that the element is getting compressed. So the amount of deformation is negative, meaning that the element got shorter. In order to determine strain in the second element, we need to know how much is the deformation in that element. But how can we relate deformation in element 1 to deformation in element 2? Here, we need to use the concept of similar triangles, which is going to be used several times throughout mechanics of materials. So make sure to learn that carefully. The horizontal beam that is connecting these two parts is rigid, which means that when it's subjected to force, it is not going to bend or deform, but it simply moves as a one straight line. And because this is supported by a pen at the left side, it is going to tilt as shown here. Now we can identify two triangles which are similar to each other. The first triangle is from A to C, and the second one, which is shown in green, is from A to B. The height of the green triangle over its base equal to the height of the yellow triangle over its base. The height of the green triangle is the amount of deformation at B, which, is, which we call that delta sub B. And the height of yellow triangle is called delta C, which is the amount of movement of joint C from its original position to the new position after applying the force. So we can say that delta B divided by A is equal to delta C divided by A 
plus b. Note that there is also a negative sign here, and that's because once the element 1 is compressed, element 2 is stretched. So one of them gets negative sign and the other one is going to be positive. In order to make the compatibility between these two deformations, we are going to use a negative sign. Delta B is calculated, A and B are provided, so from that we can determine delta C. In this case, the amount of deformation in element 2 is equal to the amount of movement of joint C downward. So delta 2 is equal to delta C. Knowing the amount of deformation in that element, we can determine how much strain in element 2, which is simply deformation divided by length. And that's the answer for case 1. In order to find the answer for case 2, we need to see what are the differences and what are the similarities. First of all, the amount of deformation in element 1 is going to be calculated in the same way. So delta 1 is epsilon 1 multiplied by L1. Also, the same triangles exist. In that case, delta B divided by A is equal to negative delta C divided by A plus B. So delta C is the same as the one that we had before, but the main difference here is that movement of joint C downward, in this case, is not equal to the amount of deformation in element number 2. And that's due to the gap at joint C where element 2 is connecting to the rigid beam. The main question to answer is how much is the amount of stretch in element 2 based on the movement of joint C? In other words, what is the relationship between delta 2 and delta C? Initially, when the force is applied, the rigid beam moves downward. But up to a certain limit, there will be no stretch in element 2. By increasing the force further, and after the gap is closed, element 2 will start stretching. Let's zoom into the connection. When the gap is closed, the connecting pin at C has already moved downward by 1 millimeter to close the gap. But delta 2, which is the amount of deformation in element 2, is still 0. After this limit, pin C and element 2 move together. So in that case, delta C is equal to delta 2 plus the gap, or delta 2 is equal to delta C minus gap. Delta C has already determined. We subtract the amount of gap from delta C in order to determine how much is delta 2. Once the deformation in element 2 is determined, we can simply determine how much is strain in that element by dividing that over the initial length L2. Alright, I'm not going to talk about the third case, but the concept is going to be the same. You can continue working on that problem yourself and see what you would get as the answer for the third part. Alright, thank you very much, and I will see you on the next lecture.